So today we have the next round of the Bilateral Bites series um, focusing on coronavirus and we're lucky to have Matali Mukherjee with us. Matali is a well-known face in business journalism and uh, has been a TEDx speaker, has recently become an ORF Young Fellow and is also on the uh, organising committee of the Australia-India Youth Dialogue. Today we have Matali speaking to us on crises and communication, the role of journalism and broadcasters. Thank you very much for joining us, Matali. Thank you, Tanya. It's a pleasure to be with the AII family and I hope everyone's safe and secure where they are. Thank you and likewise. This is our first Zoom podcast, so we're very excited to be trialling this with you, um, but it's certainly interesting times. Um, speaking of uh, podcasts and also news reporting, I know that you yourself have been following the coronavirus quite closely. Um, I caught your very good piece with Srinath Trin, uh, Reddy from the Public Health Foundation of India and also the um, interview you did with C. Raju Mohan on um, an economic take. So from your perspective, you've canvassed quite a few aspects of coronavirus. Um, what would you say the role of a journalist is through this crucial time? So I think what's most interesting, Tanya, is that at this point, there's no beat anymore for a journalist. It's all converged into one COVID highway, uh, whether you track business or health or environment, everything is converging into that same track. Uh, you know, I'm also reminded of an anecdote I hear from many other journalists during the Indian parliament attack that happened in 2001, where the terrorists attacked the parliament. And when people look back on that episode, they just laughed at, the, at themselves because they said it was a time when everyone was running in the opposite direction, but journalists were basically running towards the parliament. So I think it's a, you know, it's a good sort of indication of how journalists work. I think the first and most important thing in that regard, Tanya, is to keep your psychological and physical safety in mind uh, mm -hmm. for journalists especially because they're almost at the front line, just like a lot of the medical workers are. You know, you need to go into areas which are affected. You need to go and find real stories. So it's most important to hold on to that. I think at this point, there are two or three things emerging in terms of the role of journalists, Tanya. You know, mm -hmm. and I think this, you know, this is um, border agnostic. It works for all geographies. The first thing is solutions journalism. Um, one example that comes in mind in India is how in one particular district, which is called Bhidwara in Rajasthan, uh, one of the Indian states, it was looking like a completely alarming situation. It had one of the highest outbreaks in terms of COVID uh, you know, cases. And it's gone from there to now having zero fresh COVID cases. So I think the role of journalists came to light over there where they amplified what was being done at a very small district model. And that really has become a sort of a guiding light for many other states across India in terms of what to do when you're faced with that kind of crisis. That's one. The other two are, which, you know, work for reportage in, in, in any situation. One, tackling misinformation. And uh, that is completely rife at this point uh, with COVID. And the second is questioning data and figures. I think the onus is on journalists to continuously check back reference, go back to the data, question it again and again and again till we you know, are sure that we're getting the right information across, both for ourselves and of course, more importantly, for the general public. Um, thank you. No, those are really interesting insights and um, especially what you say about journalists being on the front line, as it were. Um, certainly when you think about, um, you know, investigative journalism or wartime journalism, often journalists are indeed on the front line. And here, indeed, journalists are trying to bring us um, crucial information, but I think also it has the role to um, steer or steward society in terms of um, helping to understand the situation we're under. Because in a way, we have two new things that are happening at the moment. One is a pandemic that for most of us in our lifetime, we've never faced on this scale before. And two, as a consequence, the government responses, the different national responses, um, which has quite an impact on our, um, on our personal freedoms. And again, that's something we've never really experienced for many of us in our lifetimes before. So I think the role of journalism here helps to normalise what's happening or help make sense of it. Um, certainly in Australia during drought periods, um, the role of journalism 
had a had a role to play in terms of sensitizing people to use of water or overconsumption. So while the law and governments can do one thing, I think journalists really sensitize how we respond positively in the community and make sense of the new world that's around us. Prime Minister Modi seems to have engaged very strongly and very well with the media, actually. Um, he reached out quite early. I believe he held a meeting with media heads on the 23rd of March, just before the lockdown, to work together with them, and has also publicly thanked the role of media in the uh, corona crisis management. He's also issued an order stating that all facts must be checked on government sources. And this might go a bit to what you were referring to earlier about interrogating facts and figures. Um, are you able to shed any more light on this? Was this a um, important development of the Prime Minister's to help to quell misinformation? So Tanya, what I will say is this, um, I think the coronavirus episode has brought federalism as you know, a point of structure really up for question. I think aside from the central role of uh, you know, the union government, what's really stood out is the role of chief ministers and states and how they've attacked um, corona and what they've done with it. Maharashtra is a good example where there is a really, really high outbreak of cases. You know, we haven't been able to pinpoint the reason for it. Perhaps it's because Mumbai has such a dense population and is such an urban cosmopolitan community. But Mumbai has really been reeling with very large COVID numbers. And I think the Maharashtra state government has done a great job in terms of addressing that and, you know, putting in some kind of safety measures. So I think state governments' roles has also been quite salutary and needs mention. Uh, the prime minister has been communicating with the media and with larger sections of the industry. Uh, I will draw back again to chief ministers, though, and press on the need for consistent and constant information. You need to go out there and you need to be talking to people almost on a daily basis, whether it's the prime minister or the health minister. I think it's important to come out and talk about the data, be open to being questioned about the data and what mm -hmm. it's pointing to and what the next one, two, three step measures are. I, you know, the the, the biggest problem at this point, Tanya, and I think this works in you know many communities, is the feeling of panic because you're not in control of the situation as an individual citizen. You don't know when the lockdown lifts or comes down. You don't know when it becomes a complete lockdown. So information is quite key. Uh, on the point about misrepresenting facts, I mean, I'm totally on board with that. But as a journalist, I will fight tooth and nail for the freedom of press and for the freedom of uh, you know free speech and expression. I think what's happened with COVID, Tanya, is that it's really brought to the fore the entire fake news scenario. You know, it's something we lived with through elections, but I think it didn't uh, it didn't impact people at such a granular, organic level at, as it is now because this you know this impacts lives. This is as seminal as it gets. And I think here's where people have really begun to understand the harm that fake news can do in communities and for people and why it's important to continuously turn to verified sources of information and verified media organizations who are doing their due diligence in terms of reporting numbers and reporting facts as well. And sometimes really it is the role of a journalist to call out um, positions of power and positions of authority and question them on whether the numbers look authentic and whether the testing is being done as it should. So, you know, it's a bit of a give and take at this point, but I think the overriding theme is that we need to fight fake news in a big way. Um, one thing I'm curious about, and that, that's a, a really interesting response on fake news. We've seen it come up um, quite a lot in the last five years. Um, particularly from a, from a country over, over the Atlantic. And um, fake news has been, has been in the news quite a bit. As far as coronavirus goes, do you have any um, observation? What's the most outlandish um, fake news story you might have heard in relation to coronavirus? So I live in India, <laughs> so I can count on many stories and I will you know, fall short of fingers on the stories. But I think the uh, unique problem for India is, um, look, it's, it, it's, a, it, it's a mix of many things. It's a mix of traditional beliefs. It's a mix of the fact that a large part of our population does not have access either to education or the right information which is when information and the spread of it gets really dangerous. For example, 
if I eat a particular leaf, I won't get COVID or that mm-hmm. there is a homeopathic cure for, uh, you know, this pandemic. This is misinformation, but this is also harmful information, uh, which is what I think India needs to really tackle uh, more strongly, perhaps, than other nations. I'm not completely clued in on, you know, what the unique problems for Australia might be. But for, from an Indian context, indeed, I think this misinformation is very, very harmful because it's you know, it's touching, a, it's touching a raw nerve and it's touching a sensitive nerve where people tend to lean towards traditional beliefs and you're trying to dissociate that pandemic from what, what might be the structures that already exist in their minds. That's another, yeah, really interesting takeaway and point. Um, some of the news I've seen perhaps coming out of the United States is, um, again, it goes to human health because um, I guess as long as we don't know exactly how the contagion is spreading and we've heard that first of all it wasn't airborne that it was droplets that it could last for 24 hours on a surface then we were told 48 then perhaps 72 hours Um, we were told that only the elderly would suffer now we know that people in their 40s are dying Um, so there's I think a lot of um, concern which because it's a new virus introduced into the human population even scientists can't really help reassure us Um, So some of the things I've seen, I think, coming out of the United States also goes towards medical and it might not be based on on, um, traditional belief systems or traditional health or homeopathy. But I think the WHO is is testing certain drugs that have been treating malaria, been treating um, antiretrovirals from HIV and then misinformation about whether or not they might already be responsive. Um, And then that harming the population because people might be going out and prophylactically taking anti-malaria tablets, hoping that that will prevent them from getting coronavirus. So indeed, I think while the issue might have many permutations, the idea that citizens are stressed and anxious and looking for health interventions they can believe in, whether they're allopathic or homeopathic, that's certainly certainly true and a problem that misinformation can only add more, more harm. I want to turn our minds now to, um, I think, a positive idea that, that you've had, actually, not just on the role of the journalist, Matali, but on the role of broadcasters. Um, I'm interested to hear how you might think broadcasters as a whole might perform in this crisis. Is it information only or are there other, um, other roles they can play? No, and we've chatted about this before, Tanya. I think there are several other roles to play. Uh, You know, first, I think media organizations themselves are going through a period of flux. I don't think we've seen such a challenging environment in many years. Uh, This industry is going to be hit hard post-COVID, both in terms of layoffs, salary cuts. So there is that entire machinery that is in place already. There's two things, I think, that stand out in terms of role roles of media organizations, Tanya. Here in India, we have a national broadcaster called Doordarshan, similar perhaps in some senses to what we have in the United Kingdom, which is the BBC. And I think the BBC has really sort of led the way in terms of what kind of alternate roles, particularly public broadcasters can take on. At this point, BBC has taken on online education and education modules in a big way because of the number of children who are losing out on school years and school hours, they're just simply not able to attend school. It's really important to do this in an Indian construct, Tanya, because the number of children who have access to online learning modules is a small, small fraction. The large swath of Indian children go to government schools or other schools where there is simply no access to those kind of online learning tools. I think it's important that uh, media organizations like Doordarshan or even private organizations actually come forward and do something in terms of helping people, not just in terms of information, but also in terms of education for children. That's one. The other extremely important thing that I want to stress on, particularly from an Indian context, is, um, is controlling hate. Um, you know, it takes on different facets in different countries. In the US, for example, there is a lot of hate that's coming towards the Chinese immigrant population. In India as well, there are very hard religious lines being drawn around COVID and, you know, who to pin the blame on. And it's here that I think media organizations should really take on the role of community builders and not community destructors. It's important to understand that the pandemic impacts all of us. It's, it's really, you know, religion, religious agnostic. It's uh, 
community, creed, color, agnostic. It can happen to any one of us. And that's the important lesson to put forth. I think it's really important at this point to work on stamping out hate and uh, building pyramids of information right at the bottom for the kids and right at the top for the adults. No, I think you've, um, you've touched on two really crucial aspects there. And uh, from my understanding, uh, US President Donald Trump now has had a phone call with Xi Jinping where they've agreed no longer to um, couch the virus in a particular way. I think United States media messaging at the behest of government had been around um, calling it the Wuhan virus or the China virus to the point where even the Secretary of State of the United States wasn't able to sign a simple communique on the coronavirus because he refused to call it the coronavirus. He wanted a reference to China in it. And now I think the US and China have come to a solution on that, um, which is really pleasing. And I hope the media will play that positive role too. Um, but you, the point you've made about the BBC is really quite extraordinary. Earlier in our discussion today, you've referred to journalists being on the front line. Um, similar to a wartime. And I think in a wartime situation, we'd also be familiar with the repurposing of infrastructure, where schools might be used as makeshift hospitals uh, for the needy. But the idea of repurposing national service infrastructure, like um, a broadcaster, to be able to deliver education is a really important intervention to consider, especially in a country where online access might be more challenging. But also, I'm sure from a personal experience, being a homeschooler yourself, um, I'm sure having a, um, a service provider that could essentially take on that, that schooling role uh, and having someone talk to, to the children would also be helpful. I'm straying a little bit into the, the personal now, Matali, but I know you're a mum as well. Would having something like, like a television broadcaster help in the daily home environment too? Um, I absolutely, Tanya. I think I'm amongst the privileged and lucky few who does have access to online schooling for my children. Sure. And I'm very grateful for it. I think more than anything else, it's the psychological support, the emotional support for children to log on, to see familiar faces, to hear yeah. your teacher feel guided and uh, you know united in this situation, even though you're all sitting in little islands of your own. But my greater concern, like I said, is the large number of children who come from economically weaker sections who lag in any case in terms of the academics because it's not something they can cope with since they're first generation learners. There's no one yeah. to turn to. Their parents are often illiterate or semi-literate. So, you know, this is where something like a Doordarshan can really come in and do so much good work in terms yeah. of engaging the children, keeping them educated, keeping them informed. And I think that there's also a bigger learning for education specifically on how to move away from this testing module. Are kids learning or are kids being tested? And this is a big problem in India. So I think this could be a great opportunity to, you know, make a, re a mental reset about that and think these issues through. I think you're absolutely right. And I think the idea of a big mental reset is actually hopefully something we'll be doing across a whole range of sectors and in including um, government business and the way we approach the global economy even. I think this has been a big wake up call. And um, obviously there's a lot of discussion as to whether or not we will get more authoritarian government, but hopefully we will also see a trend towards um, a greater understanding of the environment and our planet, a greater respect, a greater connectivity, um, and embrace some of those things too. Just um, to finish up our discussion, you mentioned um, the very strong importance of media in managing um, messaging to the public, whether it's positive messaging about what they can do in a crisis, positive messaging about social distancing and how to help one another in this particular crisis. You've also uh, mentioned the positive role in um, interrogating facts, making sure that we all understand as much as we can the situation we're all in. And you've mentioned the third role, which is community builders. So with all these valuable roles that media can play, I'm just um, wondering why, why, would be, why would media be one of the hardest hit? Why would we expect to see job losses in such an important industry? Um, I think it's an apocalypse event for economies worldwide, Tanya. It was mm -hmm. literally bombing down to nothing and then bringing it up from there. I was speaking with a professor of economy of economics earlier this week and he made such a great point where he said that to kill the virus, we have to kill the world economy. 
I think that just sums it up. Um, everything goes down to some zero and then builds up from there. Uh, the media organizations in any case have been struggling to keep costs in check. Uh, staff will have to be made leaner. There is also, I think, Tanya, the learning that, you know, we can do this with much lesser staff. We can do this with people working from home, which also means that we can be paid less. We won't mm. have to spend that much on physical infrastructure. There's also been a unique problem in India, which is that there was, you know, this huge belief that newspapers were spreading COVID. So for a long time, newspapers were not being delivered to most parts of India. They still aren't in many pockets, actually. And I think mm. that has with circulation and advertising very hard. Um, so newspapers will have to scale down. Uh, aside from that, I think there are several facets of the economy that will really have to go through major resets and then take it from there. So salary cuts, I think, are a given across yeah. industries. Um, whether or not it leads to job cuts as well is a question. We, I recently spoke with someone from CMI, which is a very prestigious think tank in India, and the numbers we have for overall unemployment in India stand at 23%. That's overall wow. unemployment. Yeah. Uh, youth has been ticking at a much higher rate, so we're estimating it's far higher. We've also not uh, taken into account the entire migrant labor in India. So I think unemployment is going to be a huge issue for both skilled and semi-skilled um, you know, employees and labor getting out of this. Yeah, I can understand the, the gravity of the situation in India, um, indeed, and in the rest of the world, of course. With more than 190 countries hit now, I think everyone will be, will be impacted in, in some way. I don't think there'll be a single life untouched. Um, to kill the world economy is an interesting thing. I mean, perhaps in some ways a reset is required when we think about not just climate change and other types of um, health impacts, but even the growing um, disparity that we have in terms of um, the wealthy and the, and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, some kind of reset seems to be needed. Um, whether it's through this or another, another intervention, it just seems as though the time is, is coming for, for, for such a reset being needed. I do hope though, for your sake and for others, that um, people realize the importance of media and having a diversity of, of voices in such an um, uncertain time. Um, your points about media and um, the community are really, really important. And I think it's, it's worrying to think that we might lose, lose a diversity of voices and um, fact interrogators and um, wonderful people who can help you know, steer a positive message of community building through this time. Um, it's been a, a very interesting conversation and we thank you for your time, Matali. Um, and hopefully we'll let you get back to your, your children and homeschooling or whatever else you need to do. Thank but you thank very, you much, very Tanya. much, Tanya. And I was just going to say the only positive outcome is the fantastic uh, clear skies we have. So we're looking forward to seeing you back in Delhi. You may not recognize Delhi. It actually looks very clean and wonderful. So there's, you know, some positive uh, outcomes from this, I guess. We all sit in our balconies and enjoy the view and think of how much we want to mess up the environment but um, that's the only positive I think to hold on to right well now. hopefully we can enjoy an, a nice glass of iced tea on a on a summer day sometime soon all right Dan thank you very much thank you Tanya bye see you bye bye